Hey guys, welcome. We have a great special guest today. Tristan is here. He's a famous YouTube guy. He basically, I kind of think he's off the grid, but he's really not to a full degree. So I guess you Look can at explain. My mind, man. I know, you're pretty high before. tech. It's, it's, yeah. I guess, uh, you know, what I admire about you, you basically are doing what you really want to do. You just, uh, probably a lot of people want to just move to some place where it's out of the, you know, out of the society. And like, you just basically did it with your family and you're, you're living off the land, it seems like. So that's pretty, pretty admirable. Well, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. You know, I mean, we don't, we don't necessarily, I, when I hear living off the land, I, know. I would, of course, I'll go to kind of an extreme of like, what it's actually like to live completely off of, you know, your own land. It's something that I think is a beautiful idea, but in the modern world, it's kind of almost impossible to do, um, you know, I mean, without proper training. We haven't been trained generationally to even know, shoot, how to feed ourselves by going to the grocery store, right? We've, exactly. We don't even understand what to buy in the grocery store. Nonetheless, how to completely harvest our own land. So I think it'd be so cool to live off of our own land. And we're I think it'd be cool. One day. Well, I just saw, I just, I was looking at some of your videos and it looked like you have some land, looks like you have some cows, looks like you, um, so I just assumed that uh, you eat those cows. Yes. Well, okay. we do have cows. We haven't eaten any of our own cows at this point. Oh, okay. Um, okay. We do plan on eating most of these cows. Some of these cows are ready to be eaten almost now. So, um, yeah, so we, we do. We've got a bunch of chickens and uh, we've got a dog that eats more of our chickens than we do. Uh, wow. Because but we get a lot of eggs. But I actually I find when you eat a lot of meat, when you eat, you know, when you're doing like a ketogenic diet or something, you're going to have like fatty cuts of meat. And so if you get T-bones regularly, which our daughter loves T-bone steaks, we get those T-bones and we feed them to the chickens, we find that their egg production has almost doubled. So I think we've probably got like a 35, 40% increase in egg production just from giving them more bones and leftover scraps. I really like to eat marrow as well. It's like oh, one of my yeah. favorite foods. Uh, oh, it's you so like good. marrow? I love marrow. I love marrow. It's just hard to get enough of it. You know, you like get this bone and you get this little scoop of marrow. It doesn't really add up. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, what, you got to get the whole bone. That's what's so nice. You get the whole yeah. bone. You know, when you live somewhere where you're close to a, a food source, or if you've got, you know, everybody, no matter where you live, even if you live in a city, there's going to be, I mean, even if you check your local Craigslist, you might be able to find providers who've got, you know, uh, organic farms nearby you've got grass-fed animals and you can get a whole femur bone and if you get that whole femur bone you don't even have to get it cut up if you've got like a saw at your house you've got a band saw <laughs> you can take you can cut that femur bone however you want i like so, to use an axe myself in the backyard i just like to chop it down uh, what, nice. what uh, now do, do these chickens they they can't eat bone right i mean like how do they they, could they break the bone up or do you have to crush it you up? You know what? They just pick it. They pick all the little bits out of it that you don't get. All the collagen, right? So you have the entire collagen network. It's all tied into the bone. I mean, we think of our, we, of our body almost. I think it's, it's funny. I mean, you as a chiropractor, you probably see this a lot when you're working with other chiropractors. I know you actually train other doctors. But I mean, we tend to look at the body as like, well, you have the bone and that's separate from the muscle. And then you have the blood vessels. But when you actually look at the, the matrix of your body, these, you're looking at systems within systems within systems of magnetic fluids electrified moving through your blood, which is you know, this paramagnetic substance filled with iron. And it's constantly interacting with the mitochondria in your body and pumping through this giant magnet of your heart. And this, all this whole matrix of fluids and metals and salts. And I mean, there's just so much going on electricity. Um, it, it, it's not just like, you know, the bone and then the collagen and you just peel the collagen off. It's, this stuff is all intertwined. And when you actually look at a bone after you cook it, you know, you make a, a steak and it's got that little marrow bone in the middle. You see, it opens up all these holes and these juices seep out of it. So, I mean, there's, there's so much going on there. When, when you look at like protein, I'm really big on, on, um, you know, protein coming from something that has eyes or a shell and, you know, not necessarily a powder, not, you know, whey protein powder. While that might have some benefits for some people in certain contexts, I, I just don't think that that's, uh, that's not food. I don't look at that as food. No. Um, now there's for, properties that you get from the whole food that you don't get from these other things. Totally. Uh, I mean, for dinner, I had the, um, you, I, I order U.S. wellness meats. They ship, and it's like total grass-fed, and the, and the soil is amazing, and the, the farmers are incredible. So I, I have this steak. It's 55% uh, fat. Like it's the most fat. So I'm actually, co I cooked the steak and man, I just feel so good when I consume that. Um, I'll show you. I actually uh, have another thing that I, I don't, um, 
I order also liverwurst, but this is kind of, a, I don't know if you've mm. ever seen this before. I don't know if Kenny pronounce it. I would say a brown shiger. Yes. This has, a, I mean, it's grass-fed liver, beef, onion, white pepper, and salt. And that's it. That. That's so, like a perfect food right there. When you oh actually look at what you would make. I mean, when I, when I do, you know, I mean, we don't eat all. I wish everything we ate was our own, were our own animals. That would be so nice. But it's cool when you live in a place or when you work with companies like U.S. Wellness Meats or, you know, you, you put, uh, I don't know, butcher box or something like that when you know like this is coming from a really good source you know that the whole animal is healthy and very edible and you know making sausage or something like that i mean you you've got so much of the animal that is very affordable that not a lot of people really eat nowadays and it kind of gets overlooked and it can be way cheaper than normal cuts so i bet that that's pretty affordable that uh the what is it brown schweiger yeah you- it's pretty because you don't really I don't eat a lot. I mean, I eat like a chunk of it each day. And it's like, it's just like a superfood because you have, you actually have more nutrients than anything on the planet in the organ meats, you know? So that's one of the things I want to talk to you about. Um, You, you, I think you said you you do a carnivore diet, right? I do a primarily carnivorous diet. Now I think that term is kind of the C word right now. I mean, I don't even know what the carnivore diet is, right? A lot of people say there's this diet, that diet, the keto diet. And right. as you know, you and I know there's a million different ways we can do a ketogenic diet. Right. I do a ketogenic diet that basically comes all from the animal kingdom right now. And that's not because I believe plants are bad. It's not because I think that we should all eat this way. I just find myself gravitating towards these foods. And I like to experiment all the time. And I'm kind of going through a phase where I'm craving just foods like marrow, heart, liver, um, fatty cuts of meat. And um, that's basically what I build my diet around right now. And I think other things that I would be consuming would, I mean, it's all peripheral. You know, I like chocolate. I think 100% chocolate's a great food. Some people are sensitive to oxalates. They're highly sensitive to oxalates. They don't do well with chocolate. I can eat it, but I don't know. I just, I do find that I function really well on a diet that's very, very low in fiber, which I would have never thought that I would say. Right? I used to be so big on fiber, but I do find myself gravitating towards lower fiber diet, high in animal fats, um, whole That's unrefined animal fats. It's fascinating. I know uh, people, um, they always ask me, well, what do you think about this? I said, well, I think if it works for you, great, do it. I mean, um, I think that when I, when I was a vegan when my, in my 20s, I'm 50 now, um, 53, and I, I actually had the worst digestion on the planet. I mean, I was like gaseous and bloating. And then mm. one day, um, I had this burger and I was like, my whole stomach just stopped bloating. I'm like, wow, wow. How could, I mean, I was like, I thought it was the fiber. We needed the fiber, but actually yeah. you need, I mean, I think you need some fiber, but you, and I don't know, maybe there's a way the microbes live without the fiber. But the, the point is that when I went with more fatty meats, my digestive system did very well. So I think um, a lot of people have a problem with, um, you know, beans and lentils and all these other things that our bodies just are just, produce so much gas and then they they think they have to dump all this tremendous amounts of fiber as fiber is the secret nutrient i mean i think it can tear you up so i started consuming fatty hamburger for breakfast i remember and i was like what the heck why is my digestion it's like it, it feels great i was just blown away so then i was like oh my gosh i'm gonna just go for this so i started doing fish and meat for breakfast and I start stop eating all these the so-called brand fiber which is um you know insoluble just terrible you know terrible. indigestible fiber right so, so yeah. the I guess the the saying goes that your gut bacteria needs a lot of fiber which we do know there's certain gut bacteria that feed off of fiber certain types of gut bacteria can feed off of certain fibers there's also uh all, you know fungus and yeast that grow in our gut and they're not all bad they're not all good it's about context and the, the gut microbiome is fascinating. Now, the assumption would have been, myself included, I would have assumed this, you know, three, four years ago. Well, you remove all that fiber, you're going to get digestive issues. You're going to have constipation. You're not going to be getting the, um, you know, the nutrition from your food because you won't be digesting it because you're losing gut bacteria. Now, I think that was definitely maybe a little bit of oversimplification in my mind. Um, when I look at it now, I mean, it's, you know, we're going to have gut bacteria for every single macronutrient, not just fiber. We've got bacteria that are there just to break down 
fats. We've got bacteria that are there to break down proteins in our body. And all of these are all connected with our immune systems in very intelligent ways that have over millennia been dealing with different dietary um, pathways. But when you look at every diet of every healthy human being or you know, every uh, human being, uh, on this planet, before 100 or 200 years ago, the main part of every single culture's diet that's unavoidable are animal foods. Um, so, you know, I mean, whether it's in India where they're vegetarian and they don't eat very much beef, much of the population, they're still obsessively consuming milk, cream, and cheese and dairy products. You know, so it's animal husbandry, animal foods, in my opinion, it, you're not going to really be gaining by removing these um and i would say that that is objectively true i guess when i say my opinion i do believe that to be objectively true um which you know I kind of talk about that quite a bit on my channel because i i was a vegan myself for a little while and eating a very high fiber diet not that i'm totally against fiber but i think we tend to look at plants and we can be naive and looking at plants as all of them being so delicious and so great and like plants are just this panacea of health i think what we might be seeing in a lot of the medical literature is what are these plant foods replacing? And that's usually, well, the bun on the burger. Um, you know, I mean, if you're replacing uh, wheat with uh, fruit and vegetables, like a lot of people do when they go into a vegan diet, they're going to feel way better. So I think that we don't want to simplify it too much. But uh, the gut microbiome is a complex thing, and it does need to digest proteins and fats as well. And eating very little fiber for me now at this point feels very good. So I... Uh, I kind of do what's right for me. What, what was the thing when you were a vegan? What was the thing that um, said you, were, you, that you made the shift? Into or out of veganism? Out, out of veganism. Okay. So vegan for me was a way to get healthy. It was a way to try and use diet to make my, make my body perform better. Right. I just, I wanted to feel better. I wanted to be clear headed. I wanted to be without allergies, asthma, chronic pain, degenerating discs. Um, I had injuries. So I started looking at diet. And as you probably know, being a chiropractor, I mean, you've been around this stuff for a long time, especially in the mid 2000s. A lot of people's go to alternative health method was leaning towards plant based diets, right? It was, uh, you know, uh, people were getting into like raw vegan, which I wasn't really too into. I periodically, I'd go through a period where I'd play around with the idea. But that was, you know, it was disastrous for my gut, disastrous for um, my well-being. And I definitely felt better than on a standard junk food diet. But long term, I ended up getting really, really sick. Mm. Um, I contracted some sort of a viral or bacterial infection. I think it was a virus or I don't know. Whatever happened to me, I was in bed for a week and there was a, I couldn't drink water for several days of that week. Um, I was evacuating everything I put in my body. I couldn't hold anything down. I thought I was going to have liver failure. Um, that was what was coming to mind because I could feel, I don't know, I, just, I felt so inflamed and I felt so deathly sick. And when I was so sick, I remember actually telling my wife, it was, I mean, it was horrific. It was, it was beautiful at the time. <laughs> it was like, uh, but I remember thinking back, it was so terrible. I remember telling her, I, I might die. <laughs> I feel like I'm dying. And it wasn't me just telling her as a joke, like, oh, I got the flu. I'm dying, babe. It was like, it was an intense experience. So um, anyways, I ended up getting really hungry for chicken foot soup while I was sick. And I don't know why. I'd never had chicken foot soup, chicken foot soup in my life. I just knew that uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, they always used organs and they would use the bones and they would use the whole carcass and make soup and they would do it for people who had cold and flu. So I thought this is what I need when I come out of this. I'm so nutritionally depleted. I've been eating quinoa and feeling guilty when I sneak in cheese or something just because it was this idealistic thing of, oh, I can live without those animal foods. I can do it. Other people maybe fail because they're not eating a whole foods diet. I'm going to do it all whole foods, lentils, beans, rice, um, quinoa, and a little bit of goat cheese every now and then. But it wasn't necessary. You know, I, was, I, was, I was fooling myself. That goat cheese is probably saving my butt every once in a while. Wow. Um, and even though I was taking B12 supplements and stuff, it just, for me, it didn't work. Um, so wow. yeah, uh, first thing I had was chicken foot soup after that. And it was wow. delicious. And it so really that's how you made good. the transition. You know, um, I have a good friend who's a podiatrist and she does surgery um, on people's feet all the time. And she can always recognize a vegan. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? 
Why don't you just surgery? The smell, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, the, 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 the tissue, it looks gray. The tissue is gray. It's not bright red, like it's gray. And I'm like, what? She goes, oh yeah, all of my doctor friends could spot, you know, like, well, that's interesting. That's so, amazing. That's incredible. Now, yeah, I mean, we, you're probably looking, all right, so a lot of the arguments, the argumentation, I'd say the main argumentation you'll see on the internet against not eating plants is scurvy. So lack of vitamin C, scurvy. What is wrong with, or what happens in scurvy that's, you know, the noticeable um, you know, degenerative factor is you're not able to synthesize collagen. So you start breaking down and dying. But what's crazy is when you actually look at all these people that are doing diets with no plants in them, you look at the Plains Indians, or with, they were including certain plants, right? But um, you look at, so I guess maybe the Plains Indians aren't the best argument over that, but they did eat primarily from the buffalo. And then you have the Inuit living off of mostly all animal foods. But of course, they would have some kelp and stuff like that. So you can't use that as an example either. But when you look at a lot of the people that are doing these diets now, there's a lot of people that are getting by on steak. For There's a few people, Charlene Anderson, for instance, and Joe Anderson. They've got two kids. I'm not saying this is a good idea. I'm not saying that I know that they're healthy because I don't know these folks. But apparently, allegedly, they've been doing 20 years just on steaks. And they all seem to be in phenomenal health. And they um, – yeah, they, they get attacked online for it and they've had to remove certain blog posts because of the negativity that comes to them. But I, it, it's funny what we consider extreme these days, right? It's like, I yeah. think a lot of this stuff is culturally um, induced and recent taboos against foods like organs, foods like meat. Uh, we think these foods are bad, bacon and eggs for breakfast. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. When it's like, that's what your grandparents did. And your grandparents weren't healing over from cancer at 30 years old. They weren't getting Alzheimer's degrees, uh, disease like I have, apparently. No, uh, they wouldn't get the Alzheimer's disease, disease and neurodegeneration in their early 40s like we're seeing today. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of different uh, um, arguments against these diets. But I think the scurvy thing is fascinating. And just going back to where your podiatrist friend noticed difference in tissue quality. That's just amazing that when you're looking at the absence of animal fats and of certain vitamin cofactors like vitamin D, vitamin K2, vitamin A, all of these involved in the, in the production of uh, your nervous system. So if you deprive a pig of vitamin A, that pig can be born blind and without eyes. And this has been experimentally done many times and proven that their nervous system is not properly forming without these fat-soluble vitamins. So that's just really horrifying that uh, you'd see injuries like that. But I wouldn't doubt it because my hip injury that I thought was getting better um, when I was on a vegan diet, I, I don't think it got any better at all. Now that I look back, it's like the amount of healing that I've seen. And of course, it's years later. And when you're dealing with a lot of uh, you know, tissue inflammation and um, scar tissue in like a hip or something like that, uh, it does take time to process. But man, the regeneration that I noticed as soon as I came out of that vegan paradigm was just remarkable and quite frankly frustrating to me because I, uh, I never was ideologically married to it. I think I just stubbornly wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. And the deeper I got into it, the more I kept, you know, this is just sheer will. I'm detoxing. <laughs> it's just detox. Those kind of things that I, I would tell myself. And looking back, it was so silly. And even then I knew better, but I still got so wrapped up in it. I mean, once you do something like that, you almost have to, people have a real hard time being wrong. So they have to maintain that rightness, despite how wrong it is. They'll keep keeping the rightness because it, cause it's invalid. All this stuff invalidates their whole paradigm. So uh, people have right. this drive to be right no matter what, even if it makes them unhealthy. But one of the reasons I, I brought you on is that um, I, I do want to um, add more um, recipes for organ meats and stuff. And you have a an amazing cookbook which you're you're sending me and i want to know more about it but i think the the organ meats meets you know the problem is like you have to prepare them you have to make them taste good there's ways to cook them and the amount of nutrition i mean even like some of the indians they would consume um the adrenal gland not a lot of it just a little bit of it on the, from the caribou which is basically yeah. the the main organ that or the gland that has the most vitamin c I think that's one of the things they got a ton of vitamin C from the adrenal glands because that's where well, there's also so animal going back to the scurvy thing. There's an interesting point about vitamin C, right? So when you're looking at foods like 
liver, which has got more vitamin A than almost any other food that you're going to find in the world. It's got 300, like I think for 100 grams, it's around 360% of the daily recommended value of vitamin A. And that's retinol form vitamin A, not beta carotene. Right. Because beta carotene is very different. So, you know, you're yeah. looking at the mineral, what's in these foods, and it's very different from what you're going to find in plant-based foods. And the vitamin C thing, I think that's an interesting point. And, you know, without consuming plant products, will you get scurvy? Right. What's so fascinating is you can't, you, you see with uh, Stephenson, uh, you know about the guy Stephenson? No. Um, he lived with the Inuit for a while. Nice dog. Nice dog. He's just keep, he wants me to hold him, so I'm going to have to hold him here for a while. <laughs> got it, man. Well, you got a, you got a prop. I, need a, yeah. I, I got a little puppy somewhere in here. He's going to be my prop. I just snuggle a puppy. Um, so Stephenson lived with the Inuit for years, and he hunted with them, and he lived among them, and he was not eating any plant foods at all during this period. He came back, and the Western science didn't believe him that he didn't get scurvy and die. They said, that's impossible. Without vegetables, you're going to get scurvy, and you're going to die. And nothing bad happened to the guy. So then he was under medical observation for, I think, two years. It was either a year or two years doing the same thing, eating organs, fatty animal cuts, and meat. And he was totally fine. And if you read, you know, actually the literature on it, they say, much to our surprise, he didn't die. So they're trying to prove this. You know, the, it, It's really interesting to me, the, uh, the, the, the difficulty in reconciling the scurvy idea and the not eating plants, but it, but it has been observed in so many people that without eating plants, people are not getting these vitamin C deficiencies. What I would posit is an alternate thing that could be happening is you're getting a lot of these other cofactors that are involved with the building up of uh, collagen. So you're yeah. eating, when you're eating animal foods, you're eating the entire collagen matrix of the animal. You're getting a lot of glycine, proline, which these are also precursors to collagen synthesis. So yeah. we could be looking at multiple pathways leading to the same destination. And um, perhaps, just perhaps, you're not going to have to worry about scurvy and stuff if you're getting the right vitamins and minerals in from the whole animal which uh, Stefan said observed and he also noted that if he didn't eat a lot of fatty pieces and if he just ate lean meat he would get sick get diarrhea vomit and feel like crap so start getting all the scurvy symptoms right well i mean there, there is actually vitamin c in liver i mean it's yeah. um and glycogen yeah. as well you got, you got the active form of um vitamin I mean, vitamin A, you got, you got iron, you got B12, you got B1, B2, full, uh, folate, just crazy amounts of folate. Yeah, it's like a lot of folate. And also coenzyme Q10. Yeah. So coenzyme right. Q10 is a massive antioxidant, very powerful antioxidant. Yep. Your body C-L-A. also makes. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Yep. I mean, body also... there's, there's so many nutrients that you can survive off of. I mean, you're going to thrive. You're going to thrive. So, um, so, yeah. So, I mean, foods like liver, if you, I think one of the most powerful scenes in like a modern film is uh, in The Revenant when Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, his character, um, hasn't eaten in days. He's completely beaten and uh, busted up and he's almost dying. And uh, he finds a, uh, a guy who just killed a buffalo and he gives him the raw liver and just the viscerality of that scene. And that being the first thing. And then the guy looked at him in his eyes and looked at him and you could see just at the most human basic level that non-verbally this guy understood what was going on and as it was portrayed in the film it was really beautiful and he just ate that raw liver like it was uh, like it was his job and when you look at um any apex predators they're all going for the fatty parts of the animal they go for the liver the heart and they'll eat the guts as well and they do that for a reason they do not digest that lean meat and look for the nutrients in the lean meat that they do in foods like marrow and liver and heart. So these are foods that are actually really, really easy to prepare. It's not really hard to make heart or liver a part of your diet, like a few times a week, making something just like some liver sauteed in butter, you know, really simple recipes. You mentioned our book, like we've got some recipes for, we've got an entire section on organ meats in our book, The Ketogenic Edge Cookbook. So we've got, we call it the odd bit section. We teach you just, you know, how to make bone broth, how to prepare liver, um, how to make heart, kidney, how to prepare tongue, how to make your own tallow. So, I mean, there's, there's so many ways that you can use the entire animal and get really affordable pieces of the animal, and they're the most nutritious pieces. So you mentioned like a liver, you know, vitamin A, D, E, K, folate. The amount of B12 in liver is so absurd. It's like this is the food that people would go for first when they were starving. And this is literally one of the most imp- important um, human foods 
um, in the world is liver, the liver of ruminant animals, especially. Um, you know, coenzyme Q10, it's a powerful antioxidant. Um, as we age, we produce less of it. So getting in foods like liver at least, you know, once a week is something that we definitely uh, made a big part of our lives when we first started out on uh, eating a higher fat diet about five years ago. My daughter was a year old after she experienced dental caries um, mm. because likely due to, um, like, that's why it hit me earlier when you said the podiatrist saw that the bones of these kids, we were doing a vegan diet before my daughter was conceived. and She got dental caries immediately uh, oh. when they, they broke through her gum. My so, I mean, by the grace of God, we weren't doing it while she was pregnant, but we were, you know, I, I wouldn't have done that. I had known, um, I'd known well enough at that time to, to know that, but not to. Um, you, you know, one, one thing I just, I just remembered when I was a kid, probably five, six years old for, for my birthday, I don't know why I requested this. My, half of my family is Swedish. And so that we had all these, they had the Swedish butter. I wanted butter. I wanted a pound of butter. I would eat literally just right out of, you know, just eat butter. I just would, I'd craved it. And now I know looking back, I had every single tooth was filled with, you know, amalgams. And because I had so many dental cavities, I was trying to find those fat soluble vitamins, trying to get them innately. But obviously it was too late because I didn't stop eating sugar until I was 20. Yeah. Three years old and, and what's that and when you're eating sugar it's your, the white sugar especially you're having to leach minerals out of your body oh, yeah. to absorb and deal with that sugar to absorb with the glycation i mean there's a lot going on so i uh, yeah man that's crazy when you look at uh you read weston a price's book nutrition yeah. and physical regeneration yeah. awesome uh, that, that's an amazing book so yeah he gets into the same thing he would have kids where they were having behavioral issues and showing kind of I guess what we would consider now autism type disorders where, mm -hmm. you know, social issues, not performing well in school, difficulty focusing, and he would always notice a nutritional component and a degeneration of the teeth. He would give these kids foods like cod liver mm -hmm. and high vitamin butter oil, which is just really concentrated grass fed butter, and they would regenerate and they become the best students in the class frequently. So, I mean, this is, it's a shame that we're not looking at this more and he even gets demonized. I mean, a lot of people, oh, well, that guy, you can't trust him. It's, it's, it's old. That's an old book. And it's never been um, demonstrated scientifically in peer-reviewed studies now. It's like, well, who's going to fund, who's gonna fund this study? You know, no let's money. take some orphans and let's give them some good high-fat foods and let's turn their life around. It's like, you're not going to see yeah, that. It's, There's no money in it. It's, a, it's ridiculous. Now, you also, um, do, do you have like old injuries? Is that why you had a lot of pain from sports or yeah. something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I have, just for me being an idiot, um, <laughs> I heard my hip really bad skateboarding, uh, was involved Ooh, with a collision with a vehicle that was totally my fault. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, yeah, I ran into a car, which in turn, um, reciprocated with its gravity right into my hip and I was going pretty fast and yeah, so I had a, a chronic injury there, but also I had some degenerative stuff as well because, you know, you mentioned dental cavities, you know, looking back also had at, I think six teeth filled when I was 10 um, and then various, you know, dental issues after that. But uh, scoliosis was diagnosed in seventh grade and that wasn't, I'm pretty sure it's not a genetic thing. I don't think that my back was, I was just born with it twisted. It was posture. I mean, it was, um, you know, my bones not being strong enough perhaps, who knows, you know, just, I mean, what do we do all day when we're in school? We lean over our desks. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I think there are big nutritional deficiencies too that would be involved with the proper growth of your spine and the proper healing. And um, that definitely got me into looking at nutrition as a way to try to regenerate the body and be and, free of pain. And you were, you, were, you were pretty close to becoming a chiropractor at one point. But yeah. Yeah. so, so did you, do you still have hip pain? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I still have a hip, so it still hurts every once in a while. Which but side, it's, you know, which side is it? A different. Uh, my left side. Left side? Is that where you got hit? Yeah. yeah. So I got hit, um, you know, I was going sideways uh, into the side of a car. But also, I remember I was diagnosed scoliosis before this. Mm -hmm. And even before this injury happened, I would, re I would get knots in my, um, my thoracic spine and had really poor thoracic extension and, you know, forward neck, mm -hmm. all this stuff. Um, and, wow. uh, man, I'm, I'm really – definitely a big proponent uh, or a proponent but i just definitely a big believer in posture greatly affecting things like digestion and general health like i i'm uh 
I'm not a chiropractor, so I've got no invest, no vested interest. But <laughs> when people say chiropractic is is whack or chiropractors are quacks, I just laugh because I'm a man like yeah. a chiro- chiropractors that help me more than any other conventional medicine doctor that I've ever been to in my life. And I grew up with asthma, allergies. You know, I was taking amoxicillin. I remember the taste of amoxicillin. I loved it. It was pink and it was tasted sweet. And I would get it when I got ear infections. And the next time I got an ear infection, I'd get more. So, wow. you know, I, mean, I think we all deal with these things, antibiotic use, uh, low quality foods, um, you know, even more abrasive foods once we start trying to get healthy and we think, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to eat a bunch of broccoli and maybe if it's raw, it's better. Well, it's like, no, raw broccoli is not a health food. You've got to steam that stuff and you've got to make it edible. So it's, uh, yeah, the pain and uh, digestion, posture, all those things are definitely linked to me. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little tip on the uh, hip pain because there's something uh, that it's quite magical. You can get rid of hip pain or any injury at all, and it's uh, very counterintuitive. So, if you, if the car hits you on the left side, right, is that where it impacted you on yep. the left hip? Yep. Okay. So. Yes. And you can do this when when we're done here, and then you can tell me how you feel. But do you have um, a tennis ball laying around or a? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well. All right, so you, all right, you asked, do you ever experience pain still? I've got a jackhammer next to my desk. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that, this that, is a, that's good. Yeah, you could probably use know, that Yeah, I've got, I've got some little okay. crossball. Good. So you can use that ball on there. And so what, what you want to do, and you want to, um, when we're done, lay on the, on the floor yeah. and um, lay on your right side and put that ball on the mirror image on the good hip exactly opposing where you got hit on the the bad hip you put it on the good hip yep. and so nice. and what happens is like you want to find the epicenter of that so it's going to hurt like hell in fact the yeah. good side when you press on it is going to hurt way more than you ever thought that it could hurt it's like always like hypersensitive and that's yeah. just because of the circuits so when i treat people i never ever 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 work on the side of injury because that just takes too long this yeah. new method works like that so you put it on the, the good side that no one ever even deals with and you lay yeah. on it right on that hip, right on the mirror image and uh, for about two minutes and then stand up and then see how it feels on the other side. It just, it puts, you'll feel like there's blood flow, circulation. Yeah. It just starts coming back. You're like, what the hell? The body's so amazing. I mean, yeah, yeah, you put pressure on one part of the body that's low in the body and you're going to affect how your neck is feeling. And you, you know, it's, it's yeah. so incredible. Especially you have this. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I don't, I'm just geeking out on just thinking of what the heck's going on there when you, you've got electrical current and different magnetic fields being created by those electrical currents, and there's only so much energy in the body. So it's like, I mean, it's, I, I love thinking about what even happens kinetically in our, in our body when those, are going, when those things are happening. Yeah, because you, um, you have a loss of communication lines into the areas of injury. So you have a high amount of resistance. So you just throw off the entire electrical field. So, but the cool thing is that uh, that circuit is, is connected to the spinal column on the mirror image side. So it's all one. So you can influence this side by working on this side. It works with, like I was weightlifting with sandals once, okay? And I had a 45-pound dumbbell and yeah. I dropped it on my toe. Okay, so that hurt. So um, I instantly started working on the opposite toe. <laughs> Bam, took, took all the pain away, healed real quick. Same thing with the tip of my finger. I closed the door on it, crushed it, work on the opposite side. So you, injuries, you always work on the opposite. And uh, like they don't teach this in school. They don't teach it. They actually tell you to start working on the inflammatory areas and you, you're on that yeah. thing for like the next 10 years it never gets goes goes yeah it's like the better. deeper you dig into that scar tissue it's like it's just like well yeah i'll i'll push right back <laughs> it's yeah it's like right. i will grow stronger yeah right oh it's funny and then you you find yourself walking differently and then you see you know, that's going to affect all the way up your entire spine if you're walking weird um and you know same thing with gut issues right you can get gut yeah. issues that are greatly exacerbated by injuries or vice versa gut well, issues the, the, create back pain yeah the, the biggest thing i see and probably this is probably the most common thing in practice is gallbladder congestion the gallbladder from probably high insulin right the gallbladder mm-hmm. there's a nerve right connected it's called the phrenic that goes right up to the right side of the neck and nearly 100% of the time anytime people have right-sided headaches right shoulder it's always the gallbladder 
you massage the gallbladder, the pain goes away. I mean, that's so common. Everyone comes in with it. They're blown away. Yeah. You, and they've been working on the shoulder for the 10 years. Doesn't, it doesn't help. So a lot of pain is referred. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. It's just so amazing. The human body is so incredible. I think, you know, the way that people look at it, we look at it in segments, like it's a, I don't know, like that game operation or something. Like, right. Oh, it's just, that's my arm. And in no way is my arm connected to my foot. <laughs> you the hip bone's connected to tired. the thigh bone. Yeah, it's just all connected. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I have some book that I haven't even got to look at yet, but uh, the Thomas Myers Anatomy Trains. Um, that I, I really want to look at that. Have you ever seen that one? He's just, I'm not sure. Uh, he's like a, a, a body worker of some type. I'm not sure if he's a chiropractor. Um, but he's got an interesting interesting perspective just on the holistic nature of the human body and movement. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen it. Um, yeah. But the thing is when you, like I had a cash practice and so I didn't accept insurance. And so you had, you were forced to get results because if, if you didn't get results, people aren't going to come back. So it kept pushing, you know, more and more like, I mean, to the point where these people would come in expecting like, okay, I want all my problems gone in two visits. So like, that's kind of where my head was for for many years. But like yeah. when, when you have the typical rack 'em stack 'em crack 'em practice where you're basically lining people up and you're just cracking stuff, it's like I think that's where chiropractors get a bad name. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean so you're really big into uh giving people corrective exercises and you know, showing them how to manage their posture and stuff throughout the day afterwards. Well what what I'm big in is um really understanding the, the uh, essence of the injury and all the c compensatory muscles that are happening, especially with uh, ankle stuff and knee stuff, which how it throws off the opposite hip and then the shoulder. Mm. And so going through the whole thing and stripping off all these compensations, that's like very fascinating. And then you, you find out why the person can't hold the treatment because they're, they have this muscle that's been working twice as hard and no one ever dealt yeah. with that because they fell on their knee when they were seven. And then that, created this over here so you're dealing with like all these interesting ropes that are too tight yeah, here it's fascinating. And too yeah the psychology here. of it all too right i mean yeah. it's probably the huge emotional component you'll see with people somebody who's depressed is going to have a compressed high kyphotic posture that's going to affect their, their how their chest is how they're breathing how their diaphragm moves oh. which is going to affect their digestion yeah <laughs> I mean, it's important to get like a history of old injuries i'm talking like falling on your tailbone I mean, I was upside down on a swing set when I was five and fell right on my head and compressed and jammed my neck. I mean, Ooh. I probably, I think what got me so interested is because I had pretty much more injury than any person that I've ever That's treated. I wanted to ask you because you must, oh. I mean, no one gets into chiropractic oh. just because like, oh, I want to make a bunch of money as a chiropractor. Yeah. Like you got to have no. a specific reason. Oh. Injuries, wrestling injuries. I fractured my neck wrestling uh, in college. I mean, just snapped fractured. the neck. Yeah. Um, and then I kept wrestling and broke an, uh, the ankle, the shoulder. This, I, was, I, I was driving a bike up a hill on the cement fast as I could go. And I, the chain fell off and I landed on this elbow. It was completely shattered. <laughs> oh, no. You were in a, a sprint and your chain fell yes, off? Yes. The chain came That's off. That's the worst. Bam. Because you're the handlebars. going so hard. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it actually, the whole chain, it was a, the bike jammed and it just threw me right off. Like you always think you can tuck and roll. It happened yeah. so fast. All I could do is turn my head and kiss the cement. And it felt like some of my tooth just like jammed up. And I'm like, wow. damn, why did I do that? You're like, oh, that's going to be a while before I feel normal again. Oh, yeah. God. That's the surgery. When I was 10, I fell off a fence too. I just remembered this. And uh, it hit my head pretty hard, uh, you know, maybe, you know, suburban fence. So maybe five foot tall, five and a half foot tall, you know, like your dad can look over it, but you got to climb up it. Um, and yeah, I was playing hide and seek running from my friend and fell off the top of the fence straight down on my head. Oh, and, upside down. Um, uh, just straight to my head, <laughs> oh. <laughs> like the, you know, like forward, you know, right there. So I've got, you know, I've got like a little, oh, I can feel God. it. There's a little bump in my skull there. A little bit. I mean, you probably you, you just get up and you just like somehow. How did you survive? Yeah, that? it was like it happened oh, now. And then there was a little bit of blood, and there was some blood. I was like, ah! I remember screaming and like Damn. I was a ten, so you know, had learned swear words recently. So I think I said some swear words and went to the doctor, got a couple stitches. He was like, Nah, you don't have a concussion. You're fine, kid. And then just moved on. But who knows? I mean, I'm sure that wasn't great for my spinal cord. Oh, your um, neck, your neck too. I was running. <laughs> I, I was. We were playing outside in the dark, running. 
I didn't see the clothesline. It was right on my neck. And I literally oh, almost severed my head. And um, I mean, like, I go to school the next day and there's this huge, like, red mark. And I'm like, why did I do that, you know? So there's some film I watched a few years ago. It was like this Ridley Scott film about um, drug smugglers. I forget what it was called. The Counselor. Did you ever watch it? It was a weird movie. No. A lot of dialogue. I thought it was actually a good film. Maybe some people would be annoyed with it. It was very kind of pretentious dialogue. Uh, but yeah, there, there was a thing where they, they, they would strung a, uh, a piece of um, just metal wire across the road to get oh, a guy's head when he was I, on his motorcycle. I did see that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just, yeah. I remember that bit. That was one of yeah. the few scenes. And then there was a scene with a leopard that was pretty picturesque that I remember. And that was it. But, uh, yeah, that would yeah. hurt. That Terrible. Would hurt. That was almost you. Good thing you couldn't run that fast. Yeah. I know. Well, I, my, my feet came up. I literally couldn't breathe. I'm like, oh. I just somehow lucked out. I mean, I've done so many things where it just almost could have went this way. And yeah. so, but it, 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 you know, on one hand, it was good because it forced me to come up with techniques that deal with pain and chronic injury and also old injury and inflammation. And basically, I have, I put it all on YouTube so people can watch and get rid of their injuries. And now you get to help how many people? I mean, you've oh. got a million people have probably seen your videos. So, I mean, you've got, I mean, what a blessing to all these other people that you and I can just be so dumb sometimes. <laughs> oh. We force ourselves to have to get Holy better. Completely idiotic. There's a, there's a condition called reflex sympathetic dys dystrophy. Have you ever heard that? No. It's called, wait, sympathetic reflex well, something like that. Anyway, this weird condition is when you get surgery on an area and then you have chronic pain, it's so bad on some people that they basically be, they commit suicide. It's so bad. So they, it's after surgery. They, they have a neuroma on the foot and then they get taken out. And now they can't walk and they're debilitated. That is the easiest thing to correct on the planet within, I'm talking within minutes. So I'll, I'll have people that will literally come in with that and they'll walk out like just without any pain. So why does that work so well? Because I work on the opposite side. No one does that. No one does that. They do more surgery on the area of injury. And I'm like, oh my God, it's like taking an open wound and just like digging in there. So, um, this the so complete, sometimes what we think is going to be good for us, the complete opposite of kind of conventional. It's counterintuitive. And I actually, um, I contacted some of the support groups. I'm like, hey guys, I can, I can help you. And it's weird. Like they're not interested. I'm like, yeah. what? No, thanks. I'm like, I got my doctor. I'm like, no, no, I can get rid of your pain. They go, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm like, okay, all right. Wow. Interesting. That, that's, that's just insane. That's just insane. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, a guy like you going through all those injuries and then what was the final, I mean, how did you even hear about chiropractic and, and, and pull the trigger to actually go for it and, and do that? Well, it was in ninth grade, actually. I, uh, my grandfather, I never met him, but he was a chiropractor. And I, and I said, well, what's a chiropractor do? My mom brought me there after some injuries uh, um, from wrestling. And he said, lay down. And uh, I don't know what he's going to do. And he went, Kush! and I go, oh, my God, I feel so good. I said, I said, do you like what you do? And he said, yes. I said, I want to do that. So I'm going to be a chiropractor in ninth grade. So that's wow. when I knew. So I had to go through pre-med. I went through pre-med. You had pain before ninth grade. So you were oh, in chronic yeah. pain and you went in there as a 14-year-old, right? Yeah. I mean, by the time I was 20, I had, my hands were arthritic. I had arthritis down the spine. I was like messed up. I was like a basket wow. case. So that's what drove me to this thing. And then uh, unfortunately, the way they teach you in school is not always the most effective. I had to kind of figure it out because it didn't work for me. I mean, it didn't hold, you know, you get adjusted yeah. and you have to keep coming back. But I will say this, if you find a really good doc, there's nothing better than a really good adjustment where he has the right amount of force, the right amount of just the perfect amount of tension and bam, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is, yeah. it's the best. And my, my experience too, is them knowing what to adjust, right? Rather yeah. than just, you know, if you see them, you know, if they're, if they're just lining them up and cranking them out. But yeah, I, I, I had to shop around for chiropractors because I met a few that were just, okay, I can tell you just, you're just looking at me as like, all right, next guy. Where there's other chiropractors, you sit down, you talk to them and they look at you and you can just, you can see it, them engineering, reverse engineering your body as they ask you questions. And you can, um, yeah, it's an interesting relationship that develops. Unfortunately, there's, um, there's seminars um, 
within the chiropractic community that basically call volume seminars, volume, go for volume. Wow. I'm talking like um, a thousand patients in a week. A yeah. uh, hundred patients a day, and, and you know, you know, it's just, it's, they're not taking the time. It's just rack them, stack them, number game, just crack every. I mean, it's, I can crack every bone in your body. And the conventional right. medicine model, right? Like, I guess yeah. if you're, you want to be like a normal, you know, the uh, the American Medical Association, that's, that seems to be like the standard of care that I got. You go in, what are your symptoms? Right. Let me bang your knee with a piece of rubber. Yeah. Um, you know, here, put this in your mouth for two minutes. Okay, here's some amoxicillin. You're gone. You know, I mean, it's just, it was right. just, who, who am I even talking to? Like, half the doctors don't even look you in the face. They just walk in all sulking and inflamed. Like, their face is like five flaps hanging off itself. <laughs> they just look half dead. You're like, what? What yeah. is this? I, I had one doctor that I felt cared, and he was a, uh, uh, he was a really nice guy, Dr. Linea Weaver. He was, he looked like Jean Luc Picard uh, from, from Star Trek, and he was, uh, he was an asthma doctor. And, but he still had asthma, <laughs> but he was great. He was, he was like 70 years old that he had running trophies on his desk. And he's like, you know, still uses an inhaler, but he was, he was the asthma guy and wow. he wanted to help people. But all he knew how to do was have you blow into a freaking thing. And then <laughs> tell you, yeah, you're fine today here. Next time you get your, next time your lungs seize up and you can't breathe, inhale this steroid. And it was like, there's no thinking of maybe diet is affecting you. They don't maybe make the connection. The sun, you know, maybe you should be looking at other lifestyle factors. Maybe you shouldn't be eating Cheerios. Uh, and mama should be making you some, some eggs in the morning and maybe have some liver once a week. You know, yeah. I mean, just little things like that that we don't get told. Um, I know. You know and, it's, and it almost goes against conventional wisdom too, what we end up finding out works, where it's like, yeah, we need fats, right? Yeah. We need fats to heal. Well, well don't, don't you find that it's, 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 it's almost every single recommendation is the truth is the opposite i mean it's like it's it's literally i'm serious it's a hundred percent i know opposite. it's so hard to, it's so hard to, to like it, it could be really hard for me to try and and legitimize <laughs> any of the things that the mainstream medical establishment says so i'm just i feel like myself constantly just trying to understand from somebody's perspective who buys into the charade <laughs> just i don't i think it's all a big charade at this point it's like there's so much it's so backwards and it's so maybe that's just the nature of it though where it's like i don't obviously doctors think they're doing the right thing right and the people at these pharmaceutical companies they probably think that they're doing the right thing because when you're blind like, you can be completely blinded by greed so easily people human beings are so flawed we're so we're so um, open to manipulation by our lower nature that, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, to, to look at an entire profession and think, oh, wow, that's like, they've all been duped. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really not that hard. I mean, humans are greedy creatures. We're really easily puffed up with pride, right? So if you tell somebody that they're brilliant because they went into $20,000 worth of debt or because daddy pushed them so hard when they were a little kid, made them want to go to Harvard and become a doctor. And now, you know, they're just trying to pay off their debt. Now, you know, it's like, we think that it, it, it's so easy for us to, um, to be blinded and to be, um, ideologically, um, um, completely possessed by something that's not beneficial to us or anybody else, just because we're making money or because, you know, being, we, we're insecure and we want uh, to be accepted by society. We want to be accepted by daddy and mommy. So therefore I'm a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, whatever it is that we tell ourselves. And um, yeah, it's so sad. It's so sad to see people suffer. I, th I, th I have a little, I have a theory about um, like in medical school, I, cause I went through pre-med and you, you basically do not have time to learn the information. You don't. It's just too much, it's too much data. It's volumes of data. So what you end up doing is you end up uh, memorizing things, getting, passing the test without any, any application or knowledge or any evaluation of the data to see if it's true or not. So we accept it all is true. And then you keep doing that over, over years and years and you literally brainwash yourself to the point where you get out of school and you have all these fixed ideas because you you can't think anymore you you were you went in be able to think now you can't think you're actually dumber when you graduate you can't even yeah, and your professors are also in this your professors are just like a little deeper into the prison to like where they yeah. figured out like 
you know, they're, they're like the shot callers in the prison. <laughs> so they get, yeah. they get like the, uh, the more accolades and they, they get a little bit more power and they get puffed up. So then you, it's, it's so easy. And I look at my university experience and looking at everybody I went to school with and the whole system, it's like when you, if kids out there, if you're in high school or something, um, when you graduate from a university and you know, you get your bachelor's degree and then you get your master's degree and then you get your PhD. Now, of course, I've, I stopped at a bachelor's degree, but I'll tell you this, you get your bachelor's degree, you come out just as dumb, confused, lost, frustrated, and uh, just uh, totally bewildered as when you graduated eighth grade. You're basically, a, but you have debt and you're told that you have this responsibility and that responsibility and you know, you've got, you've got all this other stuff going on. Oh man, the, the whole, the, the education system to me, I'm, I'm incredibly uh, uh, kind of blackpilled on the whole education system. Ah. I think that most of it ah. is just, it's to create ideologies and it's not really, when you look at the people who created the public school system and uh, you look at their writings, they actually write about it as a utopian concept that has nothing to do with intellectual endeavor, it has nothing to do with increasing human intelligence. It's about creating a utopian society of perfect of a perfectly functioning uh, ordered Citizen. society as they see it to be ordered, which is basically right. a bunch of people doing repetitive tasks in factories and, you know, being able to regurgitate information. We're going to, we're going to mold you into being a perfect citizen and you can work in our factories and get your certification. And uh, I know it's, I think it's actually, um, uh, honestly, I told my kids. It's I like said, that movie Metropolis. Remember, you ever seen that movie? It's yeah. like Metropolis, and and the the neophyte student is the uh, the golem, the the, uh, the 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 false create creature that's trying to be made, and the whole ritualistic society around it in this film is uh, is just there to create this new human, which is a total robot in that film. I mean, that's <laughs> I guess that's uh, that's pretty that's a pretty funny uh, vision oh, of it, but I, it really isn't so far off from that. It's now, now I think some of the brightest minds, they, they either are dropouts or they are self-taught. And uh, I mean, unless you find a really, I've had one really good teacher, chemistry, but other than that, I mean, unfortunately. There's some brilliant guys in the humanities departments of the schools that I went to that were like canaries in the coal mine, right? They're basically in there you know speaking out against <laughs> what's all around them that's what i found there's a few good ones in there and then there's a lot of ideologues who are just totally puffed up with pride and they think they're geniuses because they have a paycheck and you know 18 year old girls flirt with them over beers at the dining hall it's sad you know i mean the, the university system is silly um and i i, mean, I, I, think, I, I think it's valuable to get educated and get and, and to learn like i have obviously a in voracious hunger for knowledge but you know it's um a, the internet now, not that the internet's perfect or, you know, that it's not addictive and ruins people in many ways, but um, we have access to so much knowledge and we can, uh, we can learn a lot uh, outside of or in different structures. And I think that there's better ways to go about it. And then we do in our modern system and I hope to see reform in it and yeah. more independent teachers, right? Like guys like you who are out there educating people and helping people. And you mentioned that you actually would, you know, train other chiropractors at seminars and stuff too. So yeah, you know, I think this, that's important. Yeah, that was, um, it was, it was good. Um, it was a lot of work. Um, but then I found out it was easier to train the lay person. I was like, wow, they don't have all these fixed ideas. So what I did is I said, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to put all this information out there and see what happens. And people liked it. And so they apply it and they get it. They don't, I mean, I think, um, the more educated someone is, the more educated, the harder it is for them to learn new things. And so I had these guys that like went way beyond their basic training and man, they just couldn't get it. So, I mean, they got straight A's, but they couldn't, they're, they're not very practical. They couldn't quite make it in the real life. So anyway, that's, that's a long story. Well, I guess, you know, with nutrition, it's the same thing. Like, you know, people yeah. have, have had to kind of have to figure it out outside the standard guidelines that we've been given. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny because we can be told, well, these foods, these are bad because they're high in cholesterol. You shouldn't have eggs or bacon. You shouldn't eat these foods because they've got cholesterol. I mean, this is, these are the things that we've been told. And we have to actually be able to, first of all, be intelligent enough to question it. And then second of all, be confident enough to be able to live in a manner without being constantly worried about the other narratives, right? It's like you have to, uh, 
it, it takes a lot for people to actually even start to implement some of these nutritional practices that have been around forever, like eating eggs and butter, right? Yeah. Not cooking in margarine, not using vegetable oil, not eating bread every freaking meal because it's not even human food. You know, I mean, these are, these are things that we've kind of had to figure out on our own. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, bringing it back to like the basics of human nutrition that are unavoidably important. There's certain fat soluble vitamins that we need, right? I mean, we need yeah. things like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K. You know, we need these fat soluble vitamins. We need protein that's easily digested. And a lot of people aren't digesting very well. And animal based foods actually digest easier than any other foods out there. And we forget um, because we've been so inundated with, you know, thinking that soluble fiber and taking, you know, psyllium husk powder and, and Metamucil uh, is how you get good digestion. But, you know, fats and foods like marrow play a really important part. You know, bone marrow has got components in it that you can actually regenerate um, your gut lining with. I mean, bone marrow is filled with adiponectin in our body. So our bone marrow stores this adiponectin, which helps us to maintain insulin sensitivity, uh, helps us to break down fat. Um, and it's also associated high levels of adiponectin associated with decreased risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and all these other conditions. So, I mean, just eating foods like this, like marrow, where it's so rich in fats, where it's got all these stem cells of the animal are being stored in the fat and the marrow and all these regenerative um, properties have been associated with these foods for millennia. But we've suddenly started throwing these foods out because we thought they were useless. Like, what am I going to do with these bones? What am I going to do with this liver? And we yeah. forget that these are the best parts of the animal. So, you know, just learning how to implement foods like liver and heart. One of the things that we like to do, we, we usually recommend people when you're first starting out, um, try heart. Heart's one of the most nutrient-dense pieces of the animal. And you can get it ground up just like ground beef from a butcher. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you just go to the butcher, you get it ground up with your ground beef, you can do like 75, 25 to start, or you can go up to like 50% heart, but we'll make meatballs sometimes with 100% beef heart, it's very lean, so you're probably going to want to add some sort of a fat to have with it, you know, grass Coenzyme fed butter. Coenzyme Q10 on steroids. Exactly, literally, like your heart, when you think about your heart, so your heart is the most powerful magnetic field in your body besides your brain. And that's where we've got the most mitochondria in our body, actually, the heart and the brain. So these two tissues are also the, some of the most important uh, stores of certain vitamins and factors that you're not going to find elsewhere. You know, the brain got a lot of uh, DHA. The human brain needs fats. It's made mostly of cholesterol and uh, uh, DHA. Uh, and then coenzyme Q10 in heart, you're not going to find any other food on the planet with more coenzyme Q10 than heart. Also, loads of iron folate um but it just tastes amazing too so you can make meatballs with ground up heart uh we really like doing that like jessica's got some recipe called uh, mama's best meatballs in her book uh which she gave me author credit but i you know i get my wife she did this whole book you know jessica she's the brains behind the ketogenic edge cookbook so uh, yeah, I, can't, yeah, you know, I can't wait to get it because i i what i want to do is now i i do a lot of vegetables but i don't want to do like chicken lean chicken breast what I'd like to do is do my veggies are fermented and then add the organ meats with that. That's what I want to try. I think that, and then add the intermittent fasting because you're going to get like massive quantities of fat soluble vitamins, way better than a piece of lean protein, you know, like, and you're Absolutely. getting- Absolutely. Chicken breast, I look at chicken breast as like then the totem pole of protein sources. Like chicken is, is least priority for me. Like <laughs> ruminant animals, you're getting so much more. And the liver, uh, the heart, I mean, even the brain, like we, we show you how to make brain in the book too. Really? Like real simple traditional recipes that people have used for so long. Like, you know, eggs and brain, scrambled eggs and brain is how they, how they do it here. They'll make tortillas as well with just the egg and the brain. And then they'll just fry it up on both sides until I don't like to fry stuff super hardcore. But here, they'll make a tortilla, which is brain and egg. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, you know, these are foods that, uh, and I live in Ecuador, by the way, for, um, I don't think we talked about that, but um. Yeah, you know, it's wow. just really easy to prepare foods. Liver, uh, you can also, the little tip I gave about ground beef, you can grind up liver with it too. So it's like if you've got a week where you're so busy and you're just, man, I, I don't want to have to prepare five different meals this week. I'm going to make a bunch of meat this week. You can just mix in some liver and some heart, ground liver, ground heart with your ground beef and have much more nutrient density 
And, you know, of course, you know, if you, if you like vegetables, we, I, just because I don't eat vegetables doesn't mean I think everybody should avoid vegetables. I know everybody's at somewhere else in their journey. And I like to experiment with different things. So you know, we, I like you mentioned sauerkraut because we put a sauerkraut recipe. We show you how to make sauerkraut in the book too. Just, so awesome. Those are all the foods that, you know, that our, our grandparents were eating, that uh, every single generation before us was preparing plants in a specific way and using things like fermentation, storing things in specific ways. So I think it's, uh, I think it's important that we understand how to prepare these foods. And um, yeah, you know, properly prepared uh, sauerkraut can be so amazing. I love the juice. Oh, the vitamin all, C. Like, heart. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to get your book and I'm going to actually, we've been doing a series of like recipes like keto bombs, but now we're going to do a series of organ meat recipes out of your book. And we're going to try maybe wow. some meatballs, some, we'll do some heart, we'll do some brain and we'll just. Oh, amazing. Just I would just love to, awareness. I'd love to give you some input on ways to vary them too, because yeah. over the years we can always, you know, it's like, this was kind of made, this was like our kitchen. This is kind of like our kitchen transmuted into uh, a book right we have it as an ebook too which is uh, the ebook's way cheaper obviously because you don't have to print it out but uh, we we really like we had a lot of fun doing this and we really liked taking certain recipes and rearranging them so we take like mama's best meatballs recipe which is just like a normal meatball recipe not too many ingredients simple straightforward meatball recipe with a little bit of crunch in it because um, that always helps with meatballs but you can just substitute some organ meat for that ground beef and make that recipe. I'm going to try that. I, I mean, I, I know what it takes to put together um, a, a recipe book. It's like, it is a lot of work because you got to, you know, type all the recipes out and then the pictures and all that stuff. So anyway, um, guys, for those of you that um, are interested, I'm going to put a link with his book down below. So check it out. Um, but we're going to make some recipes and um, I think I'm, I want to do more organ stuff. And I think, um, of course, we're talking high quality. We're not talking like conventional you know, animal products, but just, yeah, yeah. I usually fed. recommend, especially with the organs that go in for the grass. Yeah, fed. you want to exactly. healthy animal that's not having a lot of hormones. People think <laughs> foods like liver. I think when you talk about organs, people are like, well, isn't the liver and the kidney, aren't Toxic. those filters? Don't those right. just filter things out? They think of it's like, I drive on a dusty road all the time. Um, here in Ecuador, it's all dirt roads. And I, I got to clean my air filter every few months, which I'm glad I just reminded myself, I got to buy some of this spray oil stuff to clean it out. And, um, yeah, but that's not what the liver does. No. So it's like the liver, as you know, Dr. Berg, the liver is making enzymes. It's making vitamins and storing vitamins so that it can deal with and remove toxic load from the body. Right. Extra toxins end up, when they can't be processed by the liver, being excreted in other ways or stored in fat tissue. So, right. yeah, I think when you're eating like, you know, when you're making uh, tallow, I really prefer going for the grass fed high quality stuff whenever possible and doing your best to get quality. Um, so yeah, we're, we're real Absolutely. big on food quality for many reasons. Absolutely. Too. So I'm excited to do that. And then I'll, um, I'll send you some of the videos and you can see, we'll, we'll see how we'll, it's basically, we're going to do a taste test and we're going to experiment. We'll put some stuff together and uh, I, we, we need to do a series of these organ meats because it's people just don't do it anymore. So we'll increase some awareness. And I think, uh, I think well, how about you guys fly down here to Ecuador, come go. into our kitchen. We'll make some organ meats here. You eat some Ecuadorian grass fed beef, uh, beef go. liver. It's, and it's right uh, down the street. Right. Yeah. Right yeah. down the street. You know, but it, you, for you to fly from Florida, it's not so long. It's actually not so long, but uh, yeah. So man, I, went to, guys, I went to Colombia. How, how, let's see. Ecuador is probably okay. next to Peru, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Between Peru and Colombia. Yeah. I've been to uh, Colombia. That? that was an interesting, uh, what was the name of that city I was in? It was an interesting city. It's just old. Cali. Um, name a couple more. It's at the top. Part. Cali, Bogota, Medellin. There's another another place. Uh, I can't remember yeah, what it sure. was. Sure, Colombia is a big, beautiful country that I've never been to. I know a lot of really awesome it's, Colombians. It's doing really care. well now. With there's like very little crime, and it's really turned around. The economy's good. But what happened was I had to leave, and the Pope was flying in right after me and uh, there was a hurricane you steal your shine what the heck man oh my god <laughs> there was there was a hurricane and i'm like so i bought a one-way ticket because i didn't know when i was going to come back and i was doing a convention um and uh so there was a hurricane and they jacked up the prices a one-way ticket i had to go from panama to cancun to texas it cost me twenty five hundred dollars for a one-way ticket back home oh and i'm crazy. like ouch 
but That's anyway, crazy. So you're, you're, you're forever traumatized. So you'll never come visit me in Ecuador because of what those dang <laughs> airlines going to Colombia did. Um, they, they're actually good flights from, uh, from Miami to, uh, to Quito. You know that the capital of Ecuador is, is Quito, right? You know, wow. No wonder you moved <laughs> here. I didn't know that. It's Q-U-I-T-O. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's the, the capital of Ecuador. So if you ever want to come over, we can have some Quito in Quito. If we ever come live. down there, we'll do Quito on Quito in, in yeah, Quito. Man. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Or maybe we'll have to come up there next time we come to the States. Come you got to come to the D.C., yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've been to uh, Boston and a little bit of that area. That's nice. Yeah, in really Vermont, nice. but never been oh, to uh, never been to Virginia. You haven't. <clears throat> well, Washington D.C. is uh, the most amazing place for history, historical. You see, yeah. um, you know, Mount Vernon and Old Town and Jefferson. I'm like, it's all there. It's all the history is there. It's really a nice place to visit. Yeah, well, New England is, is just beautiful. It's an amazing yeah. area. Yes, um, it is. I, I liked uh, the Boston area. It was really cool. A lot of history there too. Oh, you know? love it. Love it. Yeah, I love that place. Very and nice. people on the East Coast are really nice. I thought people were going to yeah. be mean. I'm from California. Um, and everywhere else in the world, people are really nice. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. Everybody in the I know. Other I live in San Diego. I know. They're very nice on the East Coast. So you got, yeah. we got that going for us. Awesome. Anyway, um, I really enjoyed the, um, the talk. And uh, I got some great tips. And I think everyone's going to get this book and look forward to some of the recipes that we're going to make. So. Uh, thanks awesome. for I'm increasing. so excited to see. I'm so yeah. excited to see what you do. I know. So am I. So thanks for bringing the awareness up of organ meats. Um, it's kind of something that people need to start focusing on. Thanks so much, Dr. Berg. Really appreciate you having me on, man. Really you're appreciate welcome. what you do. You know, I mean, you're. It, it's just incredible to see like how many people you, you're able to reach on YouTube, and uh, you know, I'm definitely inspired by your your productivity. You put out two videos a day, right? Like every day. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm just amazed at how, how hard you work. And, um, you know, definitely we're, we're definitely inspired by, uh, by what you do. So thanks a lot, man. We appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. And let me know how uh, this technique does with your hip. I will. Yes. I'm going to get on that. Okay. Right after this. It always, right, it cool. always flares up when I'm sitting. Of course. Yeah. All right. Cool. Have a good one.